In our days, we see the signs of the times of Jesus' imminent return very clearly, all the more clearly because we live within the times of the signs. As we've been looking at Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, in a series that I'm calling Times of the Signs, we first saw Jesus and his disciples leaving the temple property. And they try to get his attention by saying, Lord, look at these beautiful buildings, probably thinking to themselves, Lord, as you are obviously Messiah and you sit on the throne of David and reign, you know, you're going to get rid of those Romans and things are really going to change. And this is the place where you're going to reign and us with you, by the way. Jesus says to them, do you see all of these buildings. And he said, you know, there's a time coming, and I'm paraphrasing, so go back and read it for yourself in Matthew chapter 24. But there's a time coming when not one stone will be left on top of the other here on this property. He was giving a prophecy, again, that one of the most beautiful and amazing things about the Bible is God authenticates who he is, a person outside of time and space, by telling us future events before they happen because he's the eternal one. Well, in the year of our Lord, 70, the Roman emperor Titus came through and he destroyed, he and his armies destroyed Jerusalem and they not only destroyed the place, but disassembled the temple itself and the walls, mainly to get the gold that had melted in a horrible fire off of those bricks for themselves. His disciples, understanding that he was speaking of some apocalyptic last days kind of events that they expected would probably happen in their lifetime. They said, you know, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And in a confidential briefing, he began to share with them. And thank God, Matthew and Luke have put their pens to the page and recorded these very amazing things for us in the Gospels. Well, Jesus says first and foremost to watch out, to take heed, look out for deceivers because many would come in his name claiming to be the Christ. And he warned us of wars and rumors of wars and famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. And he says, you know, this isn't the end, but these are the things you're going to see. These things have to happen first. And then he very carefully said, don't be troubled. Don't be troubled, saints. These things have to happen. He said these are the beginning of sorrows, literally the beginning of birth pangs, like contractions that a woman will have in preparation for giving birth. Usually that comes with a contraction and then another one and then another until they're so frequent and so intense and so close together that eventually you have a baby. Well, we will have these wars and rumors of wars, famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places more often more frequently, more intense with time. But in addition to that, there will be a great persecution of Christians worldwide. The people of God will be delivered up to tribulation. And he says, they will kill you and me, and we will be hated by all nations for his name's sake. I think that has yet to happen. This has happened in varying degrees in history, but this will happen Someday, maybe soon, where we believers in Christ will be hated by all nations. And he said that people, many people, will be offended and betray one another, and they will hate one another. Man, if you don't see that in the news today, you're, you're just blind and deaf and you're not paying attention. He says there will be many false prophets who will rise up and deceive many. Uh, plug in your local media source right there. There's some very obvious false prophets I have to warn you of as a pastor. And he said because of lawlessness, because lawlessness would abound the love of many, the agape, the godly love of many. And I think he's talking about Christians there who live in a state of lawlessness. The love of many will grow cold. Christians will lose their affect, the ability to genuinely love people enough to point out other people's estranged relationship between them and God who loves them dearly. 
He said, but he who endures to the end will be saved, and then the gospel, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all the nations. But he wanted us to watch out. He said, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, and we discussed a couple Sundays ago this prophecy. He points us back to Daniel, who tells us there is a coming prince who will come. There are two princes. There's Jesus, Yeshua Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach. He is our prince, the true prince and Messiah. But then there's another prince, a counterfeit, who will come in and set up a peace treaty, including the people of Israel. But in the middle of that treaty, this is a seven-year period, three and a half years into that, he would come in and install the abomination of desolation. Literally, it means that filthy, appalling thing that he will set up there in the holy place. That means within the temple that has yet to be rebuilt. He says, when you see that, let the people who are in Judea flee to the mountains, get out of town. And he tells us very clearly that some things are going to happen that are going to be specific to Israel and the people living in Israel. And I think enough evidence to believe here that this has a lot to do with the people of Israel. God has unfinished business with those whom we may call the Jewish people, the Israelites, many of whom have rejected Jesus as Messiah. But one of the greatest reasons for the revelation as Jesus reveals himself to the world, more importantly, he will reveal himself to Israel as Messiah. It's going to be amazing. Well, this abomination of desolation, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But when, when people see that, when believers in Christ see that, he, he's basically saying, hey, stand by, you know, get out of town. And then he says in chapter 24, verse 21, there will be great tribulation. Great tribulation. Such has not been since the beginning of the world. You and I experience tribulation. It just means hard times. But there is a time of great tribulation that is going to happen on this planet. And I believe it's going to happen sooner than we may expect. Where part of that is the forces of darkness led by a person we tend to call the Antichrist and his false prophet will pour out a lot of bad things on God's people. But God will pour out a lot of bad things on the evil people of his world as a part of his revelation to his people, but also as a sign that many will be tormented and they still won't repent. They won't turn to him. They won't cry out for God. And then we pick up today in chapter 24, verse 23. Before we read that, let me introduce myself as Chaplain Jason Owen, Camp Courtney Chapel, the pastor here. And um, it's really an honor to have you tuning in today. And this is a very exciting thing for me to share from Scripture about the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Will you join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for how committed you are to us, but how you keep your promises, Lord. You are your very word. You will come back for us. You will return and reign upon this planet, Lord, for a brief time before there is a new heavens and a new earth, Lord. Things are gonna get a little dicey. It's gonna get uncomfortable. Uh, help us to be prepared, Lord for your return, to be prepared for the tribulation that we will experience this side of eternity, Lord, as all nations will hate the people of God for the name of Christ and the cross of Christ. Help us, Lord, to be bold and brave and thick-skinned and committed to you and to your word, to cling to your promises, to not lean on our own understanding nor, our, nor opinions, but uh, to have hope in the cross and in the empty tomb that you are a risen Savior, Lord Jesus, and you've given us signs to watch out for. And you have explained very clearly your second coming, Lord, and what the world will see uh, when that happens. So open our eyes and give us understanding as we search the scriptures today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 
I'm reading Matthew 24, starting in verse 23. He says, he says, then, all right, after he mentions the great tribulation and uh, the fact that if those days weren't shortened, you know, no one would be saved. But God's going to make a quick, deliberate, intentional work in that time he calls the Great Tribulation. He says, Then, if anyone says to you, Look, look, here is the Christ, or there, over there, don't believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect, even those chosen by God. See, I've told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, don't go out. Or look, he's in the inner rooms, come on in. He says, don't believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Man, this is amazing stuff. If anyone says to you, hey, look here, it's the Christ, or look, he's over there. He said, don't believe it, because when he comes, and by the way, many false prophets will rise up and show you. Uh, some great and amazing things only to deceive you and if it was possible to deceive you the people of God it would happen but you and I as the elect the chosen of God the people who know him and who are known by him we have the scriptures as our guide we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to confirm what is true and what is not true to warn us of what's not true but when folks come along and say hey I think the Messiah is here. We found him. As recent newspapers have shared, there are some prophets, so-called, in Jerusalem saying the Messiah is alive today. And he just has yet to reveal himself to Israel. Israel is spring-loaded. They are ready for their, many in Israel are at least, they think that they're ready for their Messiah to show up. There's talk of that. There's been talk of that. But Jesus said, you know, when they say, hey, he's here, he's alive, he's on the planet, don't believe it. He said, therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, don't go out. Or look, he's in the inner rooms, he's inside here, just come on in and check it out. He says, don't believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Lightning is a very visible thing. And he says, you know, as lightning strikes from the east to the west, and it's just in the sky, and it lights up the night sky, that is what the second coming of Christ, that is what my return, he says, is going to be like. A very visible return. Everyone will see it. And then he says something interesting. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered. In, in other words, you know that there is a body out there somewhere, probably a dead body, because there are birds around it, eating it, <laughs> you know, plucking away. But that's just a way to say, look, there are signs. There are these evidences that I want you to be looking for. It is a very visible return of Jesus Christ. I want you to hold your finger here and turn the pages a few times to the book of Acts as Dr. Luke gives us what I like to call sometimes Luke chapter, uh, Luke part two or Luke the sequel. This is the Acts of the Apostles. How did the Apostles act 
after Jesus had given them the Great Commission and ascended into heaven, and the Holy Spirit came down and lived in and upon the people of God, now called Christians. Well, we see there in chapter 1, this is after Jesus was risen from the dead and he lived with his disciples for 40 days and 40 nights. He had revealed himself to individuals. He had shown himself alive to over 500 brothers and sisters in Christ at once. So we have this book that we call the Bible and the New Testament founded on eyewitnesses, which we need uh, these eyewitnesses to give us this great gospel. It validates this. We see that they're gathered together and he tells them to wait for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want you to go into the world, preach the gospel to every, every nation, baptize them, right? Teach them everything I taught you to observe. But he says, I want you to wait in Jerusalem first because you're going to have power, dunamis or dynamite that's going to come upon you, not just in you, but now outside it and upon you, a very visible manifestation. So wait. And then in chapter 1, verse 6, someone says, hey, uh, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? In the three years of Jesus' earthly ministry, this passage here, this question tells me that the early Christians were not in any way thinking that Jesus would install the church and that the church would replace Israel. Not going to happen. They were still awaiting the restoration of the kingdom to Israel because the promises remain that God will raise up a prophet to sit on the throne of David forever and ever. And we know that is Jesus, but he is coming back because he is king of the Jews. Another reason for his second return is to sit on the throne of David forever and ever and reign as king forever and ever on a literal throne. Well, he didn't rebuke them for asking that question. He just said, look, it's not, it's not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and then you're going to be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth, this expanding circle. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and outwards. And then, very interestingly, in verse 9, when he'd spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, we'll call these guys angels, who, said, who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? Why are you standing here looking up into the sky? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go up into heaven. Why are you standing here looking up into the sky? Know this, the same way that he went up. It says that he ascended in front of them. They saw him go. He went into the clouds and then he was seen no more. Well, the same way that you saw him go, he will return in like manner. He will come on the clouds, we will see him again, and he will plant his feet on planet Earth. I love this. Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man, as we read that after the tribulation in those days, if we look back to Matthew's Gospel 29 and 30, you know, the moon won't give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear. Well, what is the sign? The sign is Him, Himself. He Himself returning on the clouds out of the sky. Jesus often referred to Himself as the Son of Man. A way, perhaps, of saying, you know, Him being comfortable in the fact that He knows He's the Son of God. The well, Son of Man is a term used throughout Scripture to describe the human, the human person. Jesus, very comfortable in his own skin, if you will, as God in the flesh. Did not have to go around saying, hey guys, don't you know who I am? I am the Son of God. He let his life and his words and his power, his witness, speak for himself. But he would often refer to himself as the Son of Man. Well, I think he was very intentional in doing that. If you now hold your place in Matthew's Gospel, but you go backwards to the book of Daniel. And you go to Daniel chapter 7. 
Daniel gives us many great and awesome prophecies. But here's one about the, the, the coming of the Messiah. And he says in Daniel 7, verse 13 and 14, he says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. I was watching in the night visions. He was hanging around. It was at night. Maybe he was sleeping. Maybe it was just nighttime when he had a vision and he was watching. And look, one like the Son of Man, one with a human form, coming with the clouds of heaven, and he came to the Ancient of Days. Another way to describe God and all of his glory and power. And this person... One like the Son of Man was given power to rule over all peoples and nations and languages. And all peoples and na nations and languages would serve him. So as he walked the planet in his earthly ministry, another way of noting that he was very aware that he is Messiah was by him referring to himself as the Son of Man. Well, in answering the disciples' questions, what will be the sign of your coming? Well, here he says in chapter 24, back in Matthew, verse 30, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And then he's going to gather his angels. He will, he will send his angels, rather, with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, uh, from one end of heaven to the other. He'll send his angels, the sound of this trumpet. Trumpet was used to call people, Israelites were very familiar with this term, the sounding of the trumpets. They had different blasts of the trumpet for different things. Some noted it was time to party, it was time to get together for the feast. Some noted it was time to gather together, uh, grabbing your shields and your weapons as you go because we were going to do war. This was a call, a call to arms, a, to a call to gather. Jesus will come out of heaven on the clouds as prophesied, and he will also send his angels to help gather his people. We will talk a little bit more about this and the gathering of the saints to him in the clouds in future studies. But the main thing that we ought to take away, I think, from this passage today is that his return is a very visible return. Everybody is going to see this. Everyone, most especially the people that need to see him coming, and that is the people of Israel. If you look right to the revelation of Jesus Christ, the revelation that God gave to John the Apostle, he says in chapter 1, Verse 7, he says, Behold, he, being Jesus, he's coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. And then in letters of red letters here, it tells us it's Jesus speaking. He says, You know, I'm the Alpha. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. He's coming on the clouds. Every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. What does that mean? Well, maybe the Romans, uh, but those people who have literally crucified Jesus have come and gone. They've died. I think they've stood before the Lord in judgment. They await the resurrection of their body for eternal damnation if they failed to believe Jesus is Lord. But Israel, largely responsible for the crucifixion, for the murder of Jesus. And we know that's true because in Peter's great sermon on the day of Pentecost, he says very clearly, you know, that you guys murdered the just one, the holy one. But you did it in ignorance. It was all part of God's plan. God knew the people would take his son and murder him 
And God used that murder and the cross and has turned the cross into something so powerful and wonderful. This is just a little plug for you. Whatever you're going through and whatever's painful, whatever has hurt you, God is going to use that for good because you're important to him and he loves you. Most especially if you let him do that because God wants to move in your life. But the gentleman he is, he's not going to force his way and just kick down doors to, to make you love him. I don't believe God works that way. There are certain things God can't do. He can't make a rock so big that he can't lift it. And by virtue of his character, he cannot make you love him. And I know there's some theologies, some teachings out there that teach otherwise. I disagree with those teachings because it's not biblical. Those are forced upon the text. So what I'm saying is that if God can take the murder of his son Jesus and work that together for something good, God can work all things together for good for those who love him and those who are called to his purpose. Well, you go back to a prophet by the name of Zechariah and Zechariah, uh, what an amazing book we have here in what we call the Old Testament. But Zechariah chapter 12, he tells us that in the last days, Israel and Jerusalem in particular will be a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples, that others will lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, in other words, people will just stagger. They will wonder, what do we do with this place and this people? And he says in chapter 12, verse 3, that all nations of the earth will be gathered against it. Like now, the majority of nations despise Israel. I think our nation, the United States, I think that we are blessed in many ways because we are a blessing to Israel. God promised, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. He gave that promise to Israel first. Well, there will come a time where all nations, all nations, will be gathered against Israel. But he says in chapter 12, verse 10, he says, Look, I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace in those days, as uh, Israel is, is hated by all nations. That God will pour on the house of David, on, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. And, and then they will look on me. They will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. And grieve for him as one grieves for his firstborn. Amazing prophecy. Exactly, I think, what John is talking about. When he says, behold, every eye will see him. He comes on the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Israel, again, who has largely rejected the Messiah, Jesus, will someday see their Messiah and they will believe. They will have no shadow of a doubt. As Paul tells us in Romans, uh, there will come a day when all Israel shall be saved. And... Uh, Man, that will be just a powerful, powerful time. Going back and forth here between Matthew's Gospel, Zechariah, and the book of Revelation. I take you a little bit further into the book of Revelation to chapter 19. Part of this revelation, John says in chapter 19, verse 11, he says, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and he makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no one knew except himself. And he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name, his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe 
and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is Jesus Christ coming in all of his glory, visible, a sword. We know the sword is the word of God that comes out of his mouth. And while he's leading his armies, he is the one doing the fighting. And he doesn't need to employ several arrows and bullets and rounds going down range. It is his word that comes out of his mouth that slays those who don't obey him, who don't love him, who don't live for him. And, you know, his clothes are bloody, but those of us, I think, who follow him are clothed in white, it says. We're just, we're clean. The armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Well, Jesus is bloodied because he spilled his own blood to redeem us to himself, to redeem us to the Father. He is the one who's called the Word of God. <laughs> I love that. John's Gospel tells us, chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And in 1 verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus, the Word of God, it became flesh. He's coming back on his robe and on his thigh, very clear so everyone can see it, basically. It's written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. With that knowledge going back to Zechariah, chapter 14 we see in chapter 14 the day of the Lord is coming all right it's a day of judgment in verse 3 the Lord will go forth and he will fight he will fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle this won't be shiny Jesus who's coming sprinkling you know glitter and skittles everywhere rainbows flying in on a unicorn. This is warrior Jesus, both lamb and lion, coming in to slay bodies here. And in that day, in verse 4, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it towards the south. And then you, speaking to the Israelite audience, you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach to Azal. Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Thus the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you, just as we read in Revelation. It shall come to pass in that day that there will be no light, the lights will diminish. It shall be one day. Jesus told us in Matthew 24 that there will be signs in the heaven. The moon, the moon won't give its light anymore and the stars will fall. It, the sky will be strangely black on that day. It shall be one day, in verse 7, it shall be one day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but at evening time it shall happen that it will be light. In other words, you won't really, really be able to, to tell it's going to be day or night. The whole earth is going to see it. So if it was daytime, your day is going to get even brighter. If it was nighttime, it's even brighter. It's going to be a very bright and visible return of Jesus Christ. And in that day it shall be that living waters shall flow from Jerusalem, and half of them toward the eastern sea, and half of them toward the western sea. In both summer and winter it shall occur. Well, this is a global event. Sometimes it's summer on one part of the hemisphere on our earth because it's round. And the other part of the hemisphere, it's winter time. I always love to pull into Australia on the ship where it was just hot, man. As we're crossing the equator, but we love to go to Australia because it was their winter time when we visited. And uh, interesting how on planet earth it can be summer in one place and winter in another place. Yeah. It says, It will be both summer and winter it will occur, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. And that day it shall be, the Lord is one, and his name one. 
There will be one Lord, one name that's known above every other name, the name of Jesus Christ. And every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that he's Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's better to do that this side of eternity than the next because you will bow the knee eventually, whether you want to or not, you will bow the knee and you will confess that Jesus is Lord. I encourage you to do that now. So I leave you with these two things in conclusion or study. The first being that you and I should expect a literal, physical, visible return of Jesus Christ. He will set his feet on the Mount of Olives. And when he does so, it says that there will be a great earthquake and the, the earth will, will split and the crack itself will go east to west, but the land will move north and south and it will create this valley and the people of God will just be able to go through it to safety. They will come straight through that valley to him. Just as Jesus left the Mount of Olives there and ascended into heaven and was captured in the clouds and they didn't see him anymore, he's going to come back on the clouds. He will become visible. He will physically step on the planet there on the Mount of Olives. And the second and final thing I'll leave you with is the fact that Jesus will judge. He's the King. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. And when he comes the second time, it is to be established as king, and he will, he will judge. And uh, that sword coming out of his mouth, very powerful, and we love it as the people of God. But those on the other end of that sword, especially the pointy end, won't love it so much. And so I encourage you to preach the gospel, a very simple gospel the good news, which you can't really share without sharing the bad news first. The bad news is that we were born sinful, estranged from God, enemies of God, deserving of the hottest hell and death and separation from him because God, as judge, says the soul that sins will surely die. He has to punish sin with death. And so sin has to appear, appear to be a horrible thing. Whatever your sin, whatever your lifestyle of sin, However, you might practice here and there sin or fall into it, intentional or unintentional. God has to punish that with death because of how pure he is and how righteous he is. And yet as a father underneath those judge robes, you know, comes down into our planet, puts skin on and lives the life that you and I can't live on our own, dies the death penalty you and I deserve and then slays death by coming out of that tomb on the third day as he promised so we can worship a risen savior preach the gospel that good news that jesus has died for our sins and he's risen from the dead and then if we would trust him that his righteousness can be applied to us when we believe that he's everything that we need to have peace with god the father that truth is the truth that will set us free we we are justified by God in Christ, and therefore we can have peace with him. Heavenly Father, thank you for this powerful truth, Lord. And you're coming someday, your return. Next time, Lord, as we look to, you know, when will Jesus come back? Um, in the meantime, Lord, help us to, to really just capture this, this reality, that you are God, you are King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus, that you will return that you as a real person will set your feet on this planet once more and you will make things right. But there will be so much uh, violence in the meantime and there will be great violence upon your return. And so every day you delay is a sign of your mercy. And I lift up everyone within the sound of my voice and those outside the sound of my voice who don't know you, that they will repent of their sins, Lord. They will turn from their sins to you, the living God, and find peace in Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you and keep you. Keep going and keep growing.